Hello and welcome. Today let's continue and let's get this uh, part, uh, this chapter taken care of. So what we'll do today is we'll start off with reviewing nucleic acids. So we went through, took care of the nucleus, uh, talked about the nucleolus and the chromatin inside of there. So here we have DNA, RNA, and proteins basically making up our chromatin we could see. So let's go through and let's review DNA, RNA, and go through nucleic acids and then this will take us into then the central dogma of molecular biology, basically protein synthesis. So when we go through and we talk nucleic acids, we have two major classes, two major classes of nucleic acid molecules exist. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, ribonucleic acid. They're made up of nucleotides. They are made up of nucleotides, which consist of three components. One, we'll see we have a nitrogen-containing base, if you recall, a pentose sugar, a phosphate group. And we said that there were five different varieties, five different varieties that can contribute to nucleotide structure, and those included adenine. So adenine, capital A, it's abbreviated as. Guanine, capital G, it's abbreviated as. Cytosine, capital C. Thymine, capital T. And in RNA, in place of thymine, we have uracil, abbreviated with a capital U. DNA is found in the nucleus where it contains, or we can say it constitutes, the genetic material. That's also called our genes. Our genes. DNA makes up about 30% we saw of chromatin. Proteins about 60%. Okay, proteins we're going to see are histone proteins uh, that are going to be involved there. And I'll show you another picture that uh, actually demonstrates their function we could see. And then we've got RNA making up about 10%. So that is our chromatin. Now DNA, you can see right inside of here, now we've got all of our histone proteins, these histone proteins. The histone proteins are going to help to coil and condense these chromosomes. So here you can see all those histone proteins, all these histone proteins. And here they're kind of breaking away. And then here you can see this uh, DNA molecule is starting to kind of separate and break apart as well. So we coil and condense it, adding more histones, adding more histones. You can see how coiled and condensed it gets, eventually becoming then chromosomes. And chromosomes are going to be formed when the cell is going to be undergoing division, cell division. Now, DNA replicates itself. Before a cell divides and passes on its genetic information, and it provides the basic instructions for building every protein in the body. And we'll see the importance of proteins in physio can't be overstated. DNA provides the information for protein synthesis. DNA determines what type of organism you will be and it directs your growth and development. So here we can see DNA is a long spiral. DNA is a long spiral staircase looking Double helix structure, double stranded polymer, or you can say a double chain of nucleotides. The bases in DNA, if you recall, are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And its pentose sugar is deoxyribose. The two nucleotide chains are held together, you can see, by hydrogen bonds. They are held together by hydrogen bonds. 
and the hydrogen bonds are going to be found between the bases. So here you can see the backbone is going to be alternating sugar and phosphate, sugar and phosphate, sugar and phosphate. And sticking out, you can see onto the sides are the bases. And you have the same thing on this side, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. And here you can see sticking out are the bases. So the two, the two nucleotide chains are held together by hydrogen bonds. And those hydrogen bonds are going to be found between the bases. And bonding of these bases is very specific. Bonding is very specific. Adenine and thymine bind one another. While guanine and cytosine are going to bind with one another. You'll never see adenine binding with guanine or cytosine. Or same thing with thymine or vice versa. Cytosine won't be binding with either nor will guanine. The two strands, the two strands are considered anti-parallel. They're anti-parallel. Now when we talk RNA, RNA is located outside the nucleus. It is located outside the nucleus. And it is DNA's molecular helper you can think of. RNA is going to be DNA's molecular helper, you can say. The reason why we say that is because RNA carries out the orders for protein synthesis that are going to be given by DNA. The RNA molecules are single-stranded. RNA molecules are single-stranded. The bases include here adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil and uracil. So instead of thymine, we have uracil when we talk RNA. So if I was to give you a strand and tell you, here's the sequence A, T, G, C, give me the complementary DNA sequence. And you have to be able to figure that out. And then if I say, give me the complementary RNA sequence, right? So there you have to make sure if there's if there's an A, you have to make sure then you're going to have a U across from that. So next thing here, when we go through, we talk um, the major types of RNA. There's three major types of RNA molecules that I'd like you to know about, and they will include number one, mRNA, messenger RNA. It's abbreviated as a lowercase m and then capital RNA. Then you have transfer RNA, T RNA. And then ribosomal RNA, we saw making up the ribosomes, uh, rRNA. Each has a specific role in carrying out DNA's instructions. So here we can see then cell growth and reproduction. Here we've got the cell cycle. Here in the cell cycle, you could see G1 phase is where you're going to have growth occurring. And then you move to the S phase. These are all subphases of interphase. When you move to the S stage, in the S stage, you have growth and DNA synthesis take place. Right Then we move to G2 stage, where you have more growth and final preparations for division. And then here you can see cell division actually occurs. So here we're, they're showing mitosis. So here we've got the mitotic phase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis, where you have the separation of the cytoplasm, basically, and the formation of the two cells. So you got to go back and recall this cell cycle and make sure you understand the cell cycle and what's happening in each of the phases because then we're going to relate this to meiosis when we get to male and female reproduction. And you're going to have to basically know these different events uh, again when you get over there and be able to illustrate what's happening. So when you talk prophase, okay, prophase, what's going to happen is the nucleus is going to start to break apart. It'll start to defragment. And we get to metaphase, you can see the chromosomes are going to start to line up at the metaphase plate. And then anaphase, they'll start to move apart to opposite poles. And then telophase, you're going to see the nucleus is going to start to reform. And then we move to cytokinesis, you have the separation we said of the cytoplasm and then the formation of the two cells. Here's a beautiful picture depicting to us the central dogma of molecular biology. The central dogma basically tells us DNA is going to give rise to RNA, which then is going to 
help form proteins. So here we can see the central dogma is telling us that DNA replicates not only itself, so here you can see we have DNA replication that could take place, but DNA can also serve as the master blueprint for protein synthesis. They can also serve as the master blueprint for protein synthesis. Now the organelles of a cell, that's what we went through, we mentioned all of them, the organelles of a cell are concerned in some way or another with protein synthesis. Cells are miniature protein factories. They are miniature protein factories that synthesize the huge variety of proteins that determines the nature of cells and the whole body. Before we jump in, I want to talk to you about the term gene. The term gene. So DNA is going to serve as the master blueprint for protein synthesis. When we talk gene, right, when I'm talking J-E-A-N-S, not my Levi's, right, G-E-N-E, -E, gene. So when we talk genes, a gene is going to be a segment, or you can think of as a sequence, of a DNA molecule. So it's a sequence, or a segment, of a DNA molecule that carries that carries instructions for creating one polypeptide you can say it carries information that specifies an amino acid sequence gene is a segment you can think of or a sequence of a dna molecule it's a segment or a sequence of a DNA molecule that carries information for creating one polypeptide chain. Or you can say that it carries information that specifies the amino acid sequence of one polypeptide chain. The same thing there. Now the letters A, T, G, and C these letters A, T, G, and C are the letters used in the genetic alphabet and the information of DNA is found in the sequence of these bases. That's why we learned about those bases and I reviewed them again here. Each sequence of three bases, okay, each sequence of three bases is going to specify a particular amino acid. For example, the sequence AAA, if we were to have, for example, right, this sequence AAA, it will code for phenylalanine, one amino acid. We're talking C, C, T. This three base sequence, C, 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 T. It codes for glycine. It codes for the amino acid glycine. Variations, okay? Variations in the arrangement of the A, the T, the G, and the C. So variations in the arrangement of the A, T, G, C allow our cells to make all the different kinds of proteins needed. Most genes contain exons and introns. Most genes contain exons and introns. Before we jump into these introns and exons, I want to go back and revisit this segment here, this slide. This slide's a nice video, and it's going to go through and depict to us some information that I'd like you to know about. DNA and RNA are nucleic acids, polymers made of subunits called nucleotides. One difference between DNA and RNA is the type of sugar their nucleotides contain. DNA contains the sugar deoxyribose, 
while RNA contains the sugar ribose. Ribose has one more oxygen atom than deoxyribose. DNA and RNA are each composed of four different nucleotides, which differ in their nitrogenous bases. Three of the four bases are the same in DNA and RNA, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. The fourth base in DNA is thymine. In RNA, it is uracil. The nitrogenous bases guanine and adenine each have two linked rings of atoms. They are called purines. Cytosine, thymine, and uracil each have a single ring, and these three bases are called pyrimidines. For convenience, the carbon atoms in a nucleotide sugars are numbered, beginning with the carbon atom bonded to the nitrogenous base, moving around the ring, and up to the carbon that is bonded to the phosphate group. The one prime carbon is bonded to the nitrogenous base, the three prime carbon to the next nucleotide, and the five prime carbon to the phosphate group. DNA and RNA are polynucleotides, long chains of nucleotides. Polynucleotides are always assembled in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. A covalent bond forms between the carbon at the 3' prime position of a nucleotide and the phosphate group at the 5' prime position of the next nucleotide. RNA usually consists of a single polynucleotide chain. DNA, on the other hand, consists of two polynucleotide chains. The two DNA chains, or strands, are oriented in opposite directions and held together by hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases on opposite strands. Because of their sizes, shapes, and arrangement of polar groups, the DNA bases form complementary pairs. Adenine pairs with thymine, and cytosine pairs with guanine. The two polynucleotides in DNA wind around each other to form the familiar double helix. The bases can be in any order, like the letters of the alphabet. However, the base sequence is significant. Sequences of bases called genes encode the instructions for the structure and function of an organism. So we have a better idea of now, again, what we're talking about. So here now, DNA, so is going to give rise to our RNA molecule, which is going to then give rise to our proteins. So we talked genes, okay? Now triplets, we've got down as well. And now two terms, introns and axons. And then we're going to work on this other term here as well, locus. So before we jump into introns and axons, let me tell you about the definition of the term locus. We talk and we use the term locus or loci. It is the specific location of a gene or a DNA sequence. So we use the term locus or loci. It is the specific location of a gene or DNA sequence. Or you can say it's a specific position on a chromosome. Or a specific position on a chromosome. We have some diseases that we have mapped out and we know exactly the loci on the gene. You know, and exactly which part of the chromosome. Next term is exons. Exons, I would like you to know, are amino acid specifying informational gene sequences. So we want them. Exons are amino acid specifying gene sequences. Whereas introns are going to be non-coding, they're non-coding sequences, and we'll talk more about these sequences in a few minutes. Next, let's talk about the role of RNA. RNA behaves as a decoder and a messenger we can think of. There's three forms of RNA that are going to help carry out DNA's instructions for polypeptide, or we can say protein, synthesis. Messenger RNA is number one. Messenger RNA, we can see here, messenger RNA is abbreviated with a lowercase m, we said, and a capital RNA. Messenger RNA 
is a long nucleotide messenger RNA is basically long nucleotide strands resembling half of a DNA molecule. That's what an mRNA is. Next, an mRNA molecule, I want you to know, is going to carry a transcript. mRNA carries a transcript of the code from DNA to the cytoplasm. That's mRNA's job. It's to carry a transcript of the code from DNA, which is inside the nucleus, to the cytoplasm. Remember I told you, you can think of this as a factory. So the nucleus, right, is you can think of as the boss's office. And who's inside the office? The boss. The boss is DNA. So the boss gives instructions to, let's say, the supervisor or the manager. Says, hey, this is how I need these things done. So the manager, the messenger, takes this message, hey, I need the store to look like this or to look like that, the factory to look like this, and I need this done. So the messenger takes that message from the boss, which is in the nucleus, so he goes to the office. The manager gets the information, brings it to the cytoplasm, where all the machinery is at, where you can think of the all of this orders are going to be carried out now. Kind of makes sense? Okay, so when we go through and we talk then, mRNA is going to carry a transcript of the code from DNA to the cytoplasm where protein synthesis occurs. Ribosomal rRNA, ribosomal RNA, ribosomal RNA, rRNA, we have next. Ribosomal RNA, we have next, abbreviated with a lowercase r and then a capital RNA. Now, ribosomal RNA, it forms ribosomes along with proteins. And we saw where it itself was made, the nucleolus, you got to remember. So it forms ribosomes along with proteins. Ribosomes, they consist of two subunits. They consist of two subunits. I told you they fit kind of like a, uh, the, the body and the top of an acorn. They're two subunits, one large and one small. The two subunits combine to form functional ribosomes, which are going to be the site of protein synthesis. That's why ribosomes are important. They are the site of protein synthesis. This is where protein synthesis is going to happen on the ribosomes. Right? And the ribosomes we saw are in two places, either scattered around through the cell, or they could be on the endoplasmic reticulum forming the rough ER. So third, then we have transfer RNA, tRNA, abbreviated with a lowercase t and then capital RNA. tRNA or transfer RNA, it's described as being clover leaf or boot-like. So third, then we have tRNA, transfer RNA, abbreviated with a lowercase t and then capital RNA. Now we talk tRNA, transfer RNA. Transfer RNA is going to be a clover leaf looking or a boot like structure. And it's a small molecule. It's a small molecule that's going to be responsible for ferrying amino acids. So it carries amino acids to the ribosomes. There, they decode mRNA's message for amino acid sequences to be built. So all three RNAs, and we compared that to DNA, uracil is substituted for thymine, and the sugar. Instead of deoxyribose, we have ribose. So RNAs, three types. All right, so here we can see then the central dogma again, and we can appreciate the processes here of uh, moving from DNA to RNA and then eventually to a protein. So for simplification, we're going to give these different processes names, transcription and translation. So if we go back to this picture of the central dogma, you can see here when we go from DNA to copying 
When we go from having DNA and we copy DNA, we refer to that as replication. So in DNA replication, what that does, it produces an exact copy of DNA. DNA replication happens in mitosis during the S phase. So DNA replication then occurs prior to every cell division I just mentioned. Then we have the process that goes from DNA to RNA. That process, transcription is what we call it. So in this process, we convert portions of our double-stranded DNA to a single-stranded RNA to form a single-stranded RNA. I should say RNA. And this is going to happen within the nucleus. This will happen within the nucleus. So then when we move from RNA to forming a protein, we refer to this process as translation. And what does translation do? Translation converts an mRNA code into a protein. And this is going to take place in the cytoplasm. This will take place in the cytoplasm. So here now, when we go through and we talk transcription, so protein synthesis occurs in two steps, transcription and translation. Transcription, DNA information coded in an mRNA. Translation, mRNA gets decoded to help assemble polypeptides to make a protein. Transcription. This process transfers, this process transfers information from a DNA sequence. This process transfers information from a DNA base sequence to the complementary base sequence of an mRNA molecule. Once the mRNA molecule is made, it undergoes modifications and detaches, and then it leaves the nucleus via a nuclear pore. And it heads for the ribosome. Transcription begins when transcription factors, proteins, they stimulate histone proteins that coil and condense DNA, so that way it could fit in the nucleus. Transcription is going to begin when proteins, so transcription begins when transcription factors stimulate histones at the site for gene transcription and then bind to the promoter, and then bind to the promoter. So transcription factors, they're gene activators, they're proteins. They're going to come in, they're going to loosen histones from DNA in the area that needs to be transcribed. They're going to then bind to the promoter. The promoter is a DNA sequence that's specifying the start site of gene then these transcription factors will bind to the promoter. The promoter is going to be a DNA sequence that's specifying the start site on the template strand. Then these transcription factors are going to mediate binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter. RNA polymerase is going to be the enzyme synthesizing mRNA. So again, the promoter, the promoter, is a special sequence on DNA that contains the start point. It specifies where mRNA synthesis starts and also which DNA strand is going to be the template strand, or we can call it the anti-sense strand. The uncoiled DNA strand not used the uncoiled DNA strand not used as a template is going to be called the coding strand. It will be called the coding strand because it has the same coded sequence as the mRNA to be built. Except for you in mRNA in place of thymine, T, in the DNA also found in or near the promoter is the Tata box. 
The Tata box is a non-coding DNA sequence. It does not code proteins. It has repeating series of thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine. That's why you've got the Tata box. Based on its sequence, based on its sequence and its initiation mechanisms, it can cause disease. So next then we have RNA polymerase, we said, right? RNA polymerase is going to be the enzyme that oversees the synthesis of mRNA. The enzyme that oversees the synthesis of mRNA at the promoter. Now when ready, when ready, RNA polymerase initiates transcription. Transcription is going to occur in three phases. To simplify this process, we'll look at this process as occurring in three phases. Initiation, elongation, and termination. So when we talk initiation, you'll see once, R once RNA polymerase is properly positioned, helicases. Helicases are enzymes that are going to be very important. They're going to come in and they're going to pull apart the strands. They will pull apart the strands of DNA's double helix. So transcription can begin at the start point in the promoter region. So here you can see basically that in initiation, We've got our coding strand and we've got our template strand picked out. There's the promoter region. Here you can see is RNA polymerase. So helicases will come in and they're going to come in and they're going to help separate the two strands. And here you can see So here we can see initiation in a detailed picture. So again, RNA polymerase We've got our coding strand, our template strand. Here's the promoter region. So we're going to start and we're going to end here, the termination signal. So once properly positioned, so once RNA polymerase is properly positioned, helicases are going to come in and pull the strands apart. They'll pull the strands of the DNA double helix so that transcription can begin and the start point so that transcription can begin at the start point in the promoter region. Next then we have elongation. Now when we talk elongation, elongation is exactly what its name says. We're going to be elongating our mRNA strand now. So we've initiated mRNA synthesis, and here now we're going to elongate the mRNA strand, right? We're getting the instructions from DNA. So here we're copying one strand. We said the strand that we're going to copy is called the template strand. That's what you're seeing here. And the opposite strand is the coding strand because it's going to contain the same code as we have here, but we have U's in place of thymines on this mRNA strand. So this mRNA strand has the same sequence as this coding strand. Okay, the only difference is wherever the coding strand has T's, we're going to have U's here. So here you can see we're making our mRNA strand. We've initiated the process. Right, this is the template strand. Here's the coding strand. So this coding strand is going to have the same sequence as the mRNA does. The only difference is the mRNA is going to have U's, uracil, in place of thymines. So in elongation, RNA polymerase uses incoming RNA nucleotides. It uses incoming RNA nucleotides as substrates and aligns them with complementary DNA bases on the template strand and then links them together. It does about 30 per second. As RNA polymerase elongates the mRNA, 
it has helicase unwind the DNA helix in front. And it has DNA ligase, DNA ligase, another enzyme. And it has DNA ligase rewind or seal the helix behind it. So in front it's unwinding and behind it it's sealing. It's like, okay, thank you, we've used it, uh, we've got what we needed, thank you, and closing and as it's progressing. So here you could see elongation occur, the mRNA transcript is getting longer and longer until we reach the termination signal. So once we get to the termination signal, then termination is going to take place. And we talk termination, termination is going to happen when the polymerase, termination happens when RNA polymerase reaches a special base sequence called the termination signal. Transcription ends and a new mRNA molecule is going to be made. Transcription ends and the new mRNA molecule separates from the template. Now before translation, okay, before we move on to the next step, before translation can begin, editing and more processing is needed to clean up the mRNA. DNA has coding regions, we said exons, and they're separated by non protein coding regions called introns. The mRNA that's initially made is called a pre-mRNA molecule, and it contains these introns that we don't want. So here you can see we've made our mRNA molecule. Now here's the mRNA molecule. The mRNA molecule did what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to copy all the introns and exons, and it did that. Okay. But now what we're going to do is we're going to modify it. We're going to clean this mRNA strand up. And then here is going to be the final mRNA strand. So there's a pre-mRNA you can think of. Now here, the mRNA initially made, we said we're going to call it a pre-mRNA. And it contains introns. Look here, it contains introns. Introns, again, are non-coding regions. So why do we want them? We don't need them. These introns must be removed before it can be used as a messenger. So as you saw here, spliceosomes are going to come in. Spliceosomes are going to come in. Spliceosomes are large RNA proteins. Spliceosomes are large RNA proteins. And they come in and they snip out. They snip out the introns. And then they will splice together the remaining exons in the order in which they occurred in the DNA. So one way to think of it is exons are excised away from the introns. Exons, EX, excised, EX. Okay, away from the away from the introns, and they are expressed. Ex again, xxx. So exons excised away from the introns. The introns are going to go away, useless. So exons excised, and then they are what's expressed. So here you can see they're going to remain in the same order. These exons, and here we can see we've got now an mRNA sequence. We're still not done. Then what we have to do is we have to add a 7-methyl-guanosine cap to the 5' prime end. The other end, the 3' prime end, okay, do I have a picture? Okay, mm, we don't see one here. Then the 3' prime end, so number 2 then, we are going to add a 7-methyl-guanosine cap that gets added to the 5' prime end of the mRNA molecule. The opposite side, then, the 3' prime end of the molecule, we will add a poly-A tail. Polyadenine. Many A, 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 A. So if you see a whole bunch of A's, you know that's the tail end. And then the cap, the 7-methyl-guanosine cap, 
gets added to the 5 prime end. And then we have produced a functional mRNA molecule. So let's kind of add that here. We'll just add the tail here, and we can kind of add the cap here. And that's kind of what it looks like. This will then take us on to translation, to translation. Okay, you got to think about this. Look at the words. Transcription, okay? Transcription, what happens in transcription? You, in medicine, um, doctors, we're so busy sometimes that we don't have time to sit down and take notes what happened with our patients and whatnot. What we do is we'll just uh, do an audio recording, put them into an audio recording, and then we'll send them off to a transcriptionist, and the transcriptionist will actually transcribe everything, and then we can put that in the chart. Now, this next process is called translation. Translation, what do we do? We take one language, convert it to another. When we're growing up in school, my parents, they're first generation here, they didn't speak English that well. So when we would have parent-teacher conferences, my, um, I would get called in and you know the teacher would be telling, we would have to translate. So we'd call, get called in for parent-teacher conferences. And um, I would tell my mom, don't worry, you know, I'll translate. And so we would go in and the teacher would say, you know, things like, oh, you know, Naveen didn't do his homework. And I told my mom, oh, yeah, she said I did really good on my homework. And, um, you know, she'd say, oh, you know, he missed two classes. And I'd say, he missed zero classes. You know, and um, so translate it not the right way. And so the teacher cut on eventually and said, you know, this guy, there's no, you know, see, this guy's not getting in trouble for anything. So she figured out, and then they said, no, you got to bring somebody else to translate. So we're doing the same thing. We're getting one language and converting it to another, basically. Here, what's the language? We're taking a language of mRNA. mRNA nucleotide sequence, and we're going to convert it to a sequence of amino acids producing proteins. So translation then, let's check that out. So processing, we got taken care of there. Translation, translation converts base sequence of nucleic acids into amino acid sequences of proteins. And this process will involve mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. So this is where we're going to see everybody comes to the party now. We've got all the guests coming. Now, translation. A translator takes a message in one language and restates it in another, right? In translation, the language of nucleic acid base sequences is going to be translated into the language of proteins, amino acid sequences. Before we jump into there, I want to talk to you about your genetic code. When we talk about the genetic code, I need you to know every triplet, okay, every triplet or three base sequence on DNA has a corresponding three base sequence on mRNA, and it's called a codon. So a codon is a complementary three base sequence on mRNA. Since there are four kinds of nucleotides that are found as three base sequences, there are four cubed, four cubed So there are four cubed or 64 possible codons, I want you to know. Now, three of these codons, three of these codons we can see right here are stop codons. They are stop codons. And they're going to call for the termination. They're going to call for the termination of polypeptide synthesis, they are going to call for termination. They are going to call for termination of polypeptide synthesis. And then the rest of them that we see here, the rest of these codons, they're going to code for amino acids. They will actually code for amino acids. Since there are only about 20 amino acids, some are going to be specified by more than one codon. 
Also, there is AUG. AUG is our start codon. It is our start codon. And it codes for methionine. And it codes for methionine. Translation involves mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. First, I want to talk to you about tRNA. tRNA has regions to it. So let me draw a picture out of tRNA. This is kind of what tRNA looks like. So tRNA, I want you to know, has a region called an anticodon region. That's going to be right down here. Has an anticodon region. And this is a three base sequence, which is going to be complementary to mRNA, which will be complementary to mRNA, which will be complementary to the mRNA codon. For example, if the mRNA codon is A, U, A, okay, which codes for isoleucine, the tRNA carrying isoleucine will have the anticodon U, A, U, which is going to bind to A, U, A. So isoleucine. If we come back here, so when we come back here, you can see AUA codes for the amino acid isoleucine. So when we come here, we'll see this is going to have that amino acid isoleucine. So this is what tRNA looks like. It has an anticodon end. And then you can see here on the other side, it's carrying, opposite to the anticodon, it's carrying its isoleucine. Now, once ready, once ready, the tRNA is going to migrate to the ribosome. Once ready, the tRNA migrates. It migrates to the ribosome where it is put in its place specified by the mRNA codons. The ribosome holds the tRNA and the mRNA in place to allow the coupling of codons and anticodons while the polypeptide chain grows. The ribosome, you can think of it as a vice. You can think of it like a vice. You can think of it like a vice because it has binding sites for mRNA and three binding sites for tRNA. So when we look at that, right, you're going to have something that's going to look like this. So this will be one site, the E site, the P site, and then the A site. E. P and A. I remembered it as the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. A better E. EPA. So it's got sites you can see for tRNA. So I was thinking, again, we're going to have a party. At the party, you got to have chairs for people. So here we've got chairs for tRNA. And then we're going to have a chair for mRNA in here as well. When we talk about the ribosome, you think of the ribosome like a vice. It has binding sites for mRNA and three binding sites for tRNA. An A site, which is going to be for the incoming anticodon. A P site, which is for the tRNA that's holding the growing polypeptide chain. And an E site. The E site is for the outgoing tRNA. It's for the outgoing tRNA. Translation, we're also going to do the same. So we talk translation. We'll see translation will get broken down into three steps as well. We'll have initiation, 
elongation, and termination. Now, before we jump on, so tRNA, rRNA, mRNA, and when we talk tRNAs, we have many different types of tRNAs. We have about 45 different types, about 45 different types. So you can read more about the tRNA, the amino acyl site, peptidyl site, and the exit site. EPA, APE, however you want to go, whichever way you do it, as long as you can remember what you need to do. So again, we're going to break translation down into initiation, elongation, and termination. So this whole process is going to require ATP, protein factors, and enzymes. We saw a lot of enzymes come into play before in translation. We saw a lot of enzymes come into play in transcription. So here we can see lots of other components coming in as well. So let's go through the three phases of translation. We'll start off with initiation first. Now, when we talk initiation, a small ribosomal subunit binds to a special tRNA. The small ribosomal subunit binds to a special methionine carrying initiator tRNA and then to the mRNA that we want to decode and then to the mRNA that we want to decode. With the tRNA in tow, the small ribosomal subunit finds the start codon. If you recall, the start codon we said was AUG. So here you have to be able to figure that out. The first base the, is the A. The second base is the U we see here. And the third base is the G. So AUG. AUG codes for methionine or it's our start codon. Then a large ribosomal subunit, then a large ribosomal subunit attaches to the small one. At the end of this phase, everything is positioned between the ribosomal subunits. The initiator tRNA, it's going to be sitting in the P site. And the A site is vacant, and the A site is vacant, ready for the next RNA. And the A site is vacant, ready for the next tRNA. The next phase, elongation. The next phase, elongation of the polypeptide, will then begin. So here we could see then we move into elongation. Now when we talk elongation, Elongation, I want you to know, is a three-step cycle. Elongation is a three-step cycle where mRNA is moved through the ribosome in one direction and one amino acid at a time is going to be added to the growing polypeptide. So elongation is a three-step cycle where mRNA is moved through the ribosome in one direction and one amino acid at a time is going to be added to the growing polypeptide. So the three steps here, we'll break them down into number one, codon recognition. So when we talk step one, codon recognition, here, I want you to know the incoming tRNA binds a codon in the A site. So step two is peptide bond formation. Once the peptide bonds are formed by enzymes between the amino acids of the tRNA in the P site and the A site, we can then move to the next step, which is step number three, translocation. When we talk translocation, this last step translocates, or we can say it moves the tRNA in the A site to the P site. Then the unloaded tRNA, then the unloaded tRNA that was in the P site, it's going to be transferred to the E site. It gets transferred to the E site. And then it gets released. And then it gets released. It's kind of like you can think of an organized musical chairs. Now this is going to continue as the polypeptide chain grows. 
the ribosome. You can think of chugs along the mRNA. So let's look at a picture. So here we could see, let's move right to here. So here we can see our mRNA strand is making its way out through the nuclear pores. It got formed inside, right? Transcription, all that happened inside. Now it comes out, so translation could occur. So here's the mRNA strand. You can see here, then we've got our ribosome in red. Okay, so here's a small ribosomal subunit. And you can see the mRNA takes its seat in that small ribosomal subunit. And then we have the E, P, and the A sites. Exit, right? We saw here all three sites. Amino acyl, peptidyl, and exit site. APE, EPA, however you want to remember it. I remember it as EPA, so I had it in order. Some people go backwards and try to remember it that way. So here now we can see the mRNA is going to occupy its seat. Now our initiator, our start codon, comes and occupies. It looks for the start codon. Here's the start codon on, uh, on the mRNA, AUG. So it comes and binds, and now everything is ready. The A site is vacant, we said, because now the incoming tRNA is going to bring in the next amino acid here. So let's go to elongation then. We talk elongation. So in elongation, you can see here first, look at, we only have one amino acid here, that's methionine. But we're gonna keep, uh, another one's gonna, another tRNA is gonna come in to the A site. And then here we're going to see this tRNA is going to give up its chain to that one. And you're gonna see that amino acid chain is gonna continue to grow. Once this is given up, it's amino acid to this tRNA. This tRNA is welcome to take off. And then this new tRNA we've got, it'll jump seats into the P site. And then what happens? A new tRNA comes in. This gives up that chain to the new one. It jumps into the E site and takes off. So here you can see now, look at that growing chain. A new tRNA comes in. Okay, it's going to bind to the complementary mRNA codon. Once it binds to the complementary mRNA codon, again, this P site tRNA gives up this growing chain to then this new tRNA when it sits in here. And then it jumps and empties out this seat and it jumps into the E site. And then this new tRNA with a growing chain is going to jump into the P site. So you can see exactly that happening. Look at the new tRNA came in. So here you could see this old tRNA that had the growing chain gives up that chain to the new tRNA. Forms the peptide bond. And now this tRNA is going to jump into the E site. And then it takes off. And then the P site is empty. And this tRNA is going to jump into the P site. And you're going to have something like this. So it'll keep going like this. and the chain's gonna keep growing. It's gonna keep growing and growing. So you can see here, that tRNA that's gonna be released, it's gonna jump into the E site, you can see that there, and then that seat's empty, and that tRNA jumps into the P site. And look at, I told you that ribosomal, uh, the ribosome is going to chug along. So you can see it's just moving along. This is the direction of ribosome movement. So we had first, we said it's a three-step process, elongation is, codon recognition, peptid, uh, peptide bond formation, and then number three, we had translocation. So then let's move to termination. When we talk termination, so here we can see the mRNA is going to be red until it approaches a stop codon. UGA, right, we said was one. UAA was another one, and UAG was a third. So three stop codons. So termination, the mRNA is red until it approaches a stop codon. And then the protein is released. So we talk termination, the mRNA is going to be red until it approaches a stop codon. And then we can see here release factors are produced. And then the protein is going to be released. The protein then undergoes processing in the endoplasmic reticulum because remember we're right on top of that. So the protein then undergoes processing 
in the endoplasmic reticulum before it goes on to the Golgi apparatus for further processing and, short, and sorting. For further processing and sorting. And then here you can see that polypeptide is formed, makes its way into the endoplasmic reticulum, and does what it needs to do. So here you can see all term all the whole so here we could see the whole process we've got transcription inside of here and then translation outside of here again the same thing so the released mrna enters then transcription and translation You can go through and read more about the endoplasmic reticulum. And then here you could see how those proteins eventually get released. So again, here's everything summarized by a nice picture. So our DNA molecule, transcription, and then translation helping to form. Our protein. Last then we have apoptosis. So when we talk apoptosis, I'd like you guys to know when we talk apoptosis, apoptosis is programmed cell death. It works in response to internal cellular damage or to some extracellular signals. Now what happens is the mitochondrial membranes become permeable and they allow chemicals and other factors to enter into the cytosol. These chemicals, they activate digestive enzymes within the cells, destroying the cell's DNA, destroying the cytoskeleton. These chemicals activate digestive enzymes within the cells, destroying the DNA. The cytoskeleton undergoes degradation as well leading to then a quick death. The apoptotic cell releases chemicals. It releases chemicals then which are going to attract macrophages who immediately come in and phagocytize them. When we talk apoptosis, apoptosis is a normal event, especially during early development. It's responsible for carving out our webbed fingers and toes. We also see it in females when we talk about menstruation every month. You have apoptosis taking place of those cells and then new cells replenish those cells. <clears throat> 